You're listening to the Hello World podcast number 15. My name is Sean Wildermuth and I'm your host. The Hello World podcast is where you can hear from some of your favorite developers, authors, and speakers about how they got started in this business. We go way back to their first computer, their first code experience, and their first job. This week's guest is John Papa. John Papa is a well-known technology expert and is a former Microsoft evangelist on Silverlight, Windows Phone, and Windows 8. John is a Microsoft regional director and author of more than 100 articles and 10 books. He specializes in professional application development with technologies including HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, Angular, Durandal, Silverlight, WPF, C Sharp, and .NET. He can often be found speaking around the world at keynotes and sessions for conferences such as Build, Mix, PDC, TechEd, VS Live, and Angle Brackets. He currently enjoys authoring courses for Pluralsight and can be found at johnpapa.net or on Twitter at John underscore Papa. John and I have been running in the same circles for a number of years now. We kept on running into each other in the Silverlight space, in the Windows Phone space, in the Windows 8 space, and now in the web space. John's always an interesting conversation, and John and I have a lot in common. We seem to always grab onto a new technology about the same time, and I'm always interested in his perspective. In this episode, John talks about how he got started with his Commodore 64 and how passionate he is about mentoring other developers. Let's take a listen. Well, I'd like to welcome, hopefully, my good friend, <laughs> John Papa. We've known each other for, I think, far too long at this point. Yes, we're dating ourselves, but yes. <laughs> we, we stopped dating. I'm engaged now, and uh, I, think he, I think you've understood that, you know, those times are past. I'm, I'm in complete denial still. But. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, the lower podcast is all about how you got started, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, what was that first computer like? Did you have one as a kid? Did you? Start in college with computers? Where did that start? My mom and dad were, were awesome for me growing up. They were really encouraging in a lot of ways. And one of those was I was very attracted to video games when I was a child, like the Atari. Yeah. Uh, 2600? 2600. Yes, yeah, 2600. Yeah. I still have it. Cartridges. And yep. I have Pitfall and all those fun wow, games still. that's awesome. I got to crank it up thinking of that. <laughs> but so having that, being a child and playing with my mom, and then eventually my father got me a Commodore 64, nice. which is many of our first yep. in our age range. I ended up breaking it and basically, not breaking it, but I got through its uses very quickly. Yeah. So literally within about a month, we sold it and my father uh, went out and bought a IBM PC Jr. Oh, nice. For me. I don't know if you remember that, you but must that was be a, to be the new you one. You must be a bit younger than I am then. <laughs> <laughs> you look it, but... Uh. <laughs> it's It was uh, it was supposed to be the new thing, man, you know? It was. The x86 architecture that kind of branched off. Yep. Uh, I kind of, for people who aren't familiar, that maybe the Betamax comparison might be similar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it was Absolutely. very cool, but I, I had the captain board, which gave me, I think, 128K of RAM. Wow. More than you'd ever need, really. Yeah. Who would ever need more than that? Yeah. Uh, but I got into that, did quite a bit there, and, and didn't really Were you really writing do a code? Lot. In the beginning, little programs. We were using Quick Basic. Quick Basic, okay. You know, yeah. Line numbers and go-tos. I mean, was that was DOS? all rage. Yeah, well, DOS-based. Nice. Nice. And uh, uh, so you were writing little Quick Basic programs. Was that really, did you find a love of of programming then or was it just sort of like ooh this is sort of cool let me put back in the disc for uh for you know for wizardry which wizardry. is what i played yeah, back yeah. then yes <laughs> oh yeah uh yeah i love the wizardry stuff but you know the programming was fun but again you found its limits quickly because quick basic wasn't exactly you know i wasn't building large applications like that that's true but you're, my you're real thing was building single page uh, applications back then. I just was building was... them yes <laughs> <laughs> single black and white screen <laughs> yeah applications but I did a lot with uh, bulletin board systems oh, nice. back then. So I think the thing that really piqued my interest was War Games. Oh, nice. Yeah, movie, that movie. Yeah. Where the kid did you have a coupler? In. I did. Oh, really? It was awesome. I had a modem, but I, 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 I yearned for, you know, the just a bit older. You what, sorry? Coupler. You you're? yearned? Oh, yearned. I thought you said something else. So. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I was talking about, you know, Mongolian tents. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. 
No, yeah, I, I think the, uh, I actually remember my father bought me one of the modems that didn't have the coupler uh -huh. and I was all upset. You know, being a child <laughs> and being, you know, I want this dad. And so we had to go find a coupler because I wanted to be just like the movie and hear that crappy noise going through. <laughs> and, and the world? I mean, uh, was that the goal? <laughs> that, that was it. I actually bought a ticket. So my father first come to realization of, you know, hey, you're doing something wrong here was I was on a Baltimore system and I bought a one-way ticket on uh, one of the airlines to Moscow for my sister. Wow. And it actually came to the house and I had to charge to another person's account and all this. Oh, and, wow. Um, so I was doing things that I thought were funny, you know, being <laughs> eight or nine years old, but my father wasn't thrilled with and my sister no. still will not let me live down. <laughs> she would have liked Moscow. Uh, yeah, at the time, you know, yeah, yeah. why not? <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. And that's how you sort of got, you got in trouble. Uh, were you like doing war dialing and that stuff back then? Yeah, I, I did quite a bit of, I dabbled in a lot of different things. And I think where it really started hooking was when I got to college, I either wanted to be a writer or I wanted to, I love writing fiction. Oh, nice. Or I wanted to get into computers. And my oldest sister, a uh, big influence in my life is what, again, she became a teacher. She's a writer, became a teacher. Nice. And I, I have ultimate respect for teachers, but the struggles she's gone through in her life uh, financially with her children and all mm. that because of being a teacher, I just didn't want to put my family through that. Sure. Um, the good thing is now that we're Plural's Light authors, we get to be <laughs> in technology and teaching. That's the great part. Yeah. Well, I was going to say when you said you liked writing, cause that's, that's kind of how I first, I think knew you was the column you had in MSDN and maybe yeah. before then you did, I think you did some writing as well. Yeah. I did some early books on SQL Server and Visual Interdev. And oh, you're the one who wrote about Visual, visual yeah. Interdev. Wow. I did a book on RDS as well. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the, the dirty stepchild of uh, ADO. <sighs> oh my gosh. Of, uh, and when he says ADO, ladies and gentlemen, he's talking about ADO, not ADO.net. <laughs> Correct. Yes. <laughs> completely stateful type of yeah, conversations. Yeah. Well, I think you should be able to open a connection to the database in seven different ways. Why would you ever want to be disconnected from the database? Come on. We love our data. We do. We love, uh, you know, our connections and don't want to give them up. It's funny how people get to know us through the years as what we're doing now. Yeah. You know, people, people say today, like this week, where they've been talking to me about, hey, you're the JavaScript guy. And then, you know, two years ago, that was the Silver Lake guy. Mm -hmm. And people before that were like, you're the XML guy. <laughs> we change our identities and personas so often, but uh, it's funny what people remember you as. Yeah, that is funny. Uh, I had, until recently, I still had my ADO guy license plate and uh, I had given up the domain even. So I thought it's time to get rid of the license plate. And when I went to get a new license plate, I couldn't think of any vanity plate I wanted. So I just give me one. And my vanity plate says PHP is the first three letters just by randomness. Cause I, cause you're a big PHP guy. Clear, I do not like PHP. Okay. Got that out of the, <laughs> I feel better saying it out loud. I have to tell you. It's very therapeutic. It is. It is. So you went to college and were you going for a computer degree at that point? Or I were did. you sort of dabbling writing as well? Or? I did a lot of writing. I, I had enough writing to be a, a minor in oh, writing, nice. but I didn't actually get one. Uh, and I went through there to be uh, to be into computers. I think it was computer science, computer information, whatever sure. the heck it was. CAS or one of those. Yeah, and I took all yeah. the required courses that absolutely helped me with nothing. Sure. You know, like learning assembly language and things <laughs> like that. But I did have one course in college that was awesome. It was a two semester course. I think it was called software engineering. Nice. And it was waterfall at the time, which I wouldn't do today. But what I learned but that's in that what you was, did then. yeah, yeah. I, you know, you learn. You actually had a project and a team, and you all switch roles in the next semester. But it's all about how to get the information of the project, and then requirements, and then designing it, developing it, testing it, delivering it. That fifty percent of the project that when you when most people leave college, they don't know exists. Exactly. They think they'll sit. They're going to sit in a dark office and be illuminated by the light of their laptop for their entire career. And that just doesn't happen. Yeah. You don't get a tan from that. So that's not a no. good thing, <laughs> but it was a great class to go through. And that's the one I really hang my hat on is, oh, awesome. is that was a great, cause it didn't matter what technology we were using. And yeah. Incidentally, we were using Oracle forms. I think wow. it was on a Vax. Nice. So, and this thing called email started appearing on my computer. I'm like, what is this? Wow. So, How long until you, figured out whether you should put the hyphen in email or not. <laughs> I think that took me 10 years. I still don't know how you spell that. <laughs> I wonder how many people realize what email stands for too. Yeah. Exactly. It's like that little save icon, the, the floppy <laughs> disk. 
What is what is a floppy disk, Dad? Well, it's this thing you used to put in your computer. You put stuff in your computer? <laughs> oh. Why was it floppy? <laughs> yeah. So did uh, did you do any co-op while you were in college, or did you go straight to your first job after you graduated? I did. I worked, uh, see, I think I did two or three. They went for a small company and did laboratory testing, which is the only thing I remember from that company, besides they had a lot of fun, was one of the companies that they service software for was uh, Coke or Sprite or Pepsi, sure. one of those. And they had to test for an acceptable level of uh, rat poop on yeah. the cans. Mm -hmm. And it constantly com caused me concern of, what is an acceptable level of rat poop on my soda can? I think zero is the is the level I would put it on. And that is not the answer. But I'm that's... sure that isn't the answer. So now I have this uh, obsessive compulsive of any can I get to wipe the top very clean. <laughs> that's funny. Did you did you grow up in Florida where you're at now? I grew up in Albany, New York. Oh, okay. New York. Okay. That's, why, that's you're, why I did that one. That's why you're a Yankee fan. I Yes. Born and bred Yankees and New York Giants. <laughs> And then when I moved to Florida for college for a couple of years, and then went back to New York college, but in uh, Florida, I actually did an internship with uh, IBM. Nice. And that was when I realized the college education I had, I had like a 3.9 GPA at my college in Tampa and I was learning nothing because I got to IBM and I realized how dumb I was. Sure. And I said, you know what? I need to go to a different school with a better computer education program. Mm -hmm. And stop going to the beach every day and playing volleyball. The, the, I think uh, one of those might be more important than the other, but, <laughs> yes. but I understand. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I ended up graduating with like a 3.1 or 3.0 GPA, nice. which is still great, but it yeah, yeah. wasn't 3.9. Sure. But I think it shows you the level of yeah. challenge. If you're not struggling, then you're probably not learning. This was sort of my experience, and especially yeah. high school, is well, if they were easy courses, then why was I wasting my time? Yeah, and I think the high school grades are more important than the college grades are. Sure. Because high school, you're using those grades to get into a college. Right. In college, I have yet to meet somebody who said, what was your GPA? I used to put my GPA on my uh, resume years ago because mm -hmm. I had very little else to put on it. You know, so it was like, oh, you know, uh, but that it got ripped off the second I could. You know, it was like, yeah, this is the only way to make it a full page. And there's a lot of folks who don't have any college education. Yeah. Who are doing great in our industry. Yeah. It, I don't think it's a requirement. We were talking with some of the other authors because uh, uh, I dropped out of college after 15 months because I was working full time. And uh, it, kind of the same experience you had, except that I started by working and then went to college because I felt like I should. And when I realized I wasn't learning anything at college, that was remotely applicable to what I was doing at, at uh, companies that I went, I'll, I'll go back one day. And I just forgot to. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an, and not to say college isn't, <clears throat> and not to say college isn't important, but it's one of those things that it depends on your career. Absolutely. And what you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of my friends at college, I graduated from Siena College in, in Loudonville, New York, mm -hmm. a uh, great little college. A lot of my friends there in computer science who had wonderful degrees and GPAs and all that fun stuff, very smart people, went on to get their master's. And I had an opportunity to get a job. Yeah. And I, I debated on this whole thing. Mm -hmm. and I started thinking, well, geez, that's three years of money I could be earning yeah. at, a, at a company and real experience or three years I could be going into debt. And I just, I w washed it out and, you know, you got to look at how many years it's going to take you to make that money back up that you might've gotten from a greater salary. Sure. In our industry, I don't think it's worth it to do that. Yeah, I think you're right. If, unless you don't want to be a software developer, unless you want right. to teach other people to to write software, you know, at the college level or something like that, that requires or, or th please, everybody who wants to be a doctor, please. Yes. Go to as much school as you possibly can first. <laughs> and, and all you actually require, you know, the Venezuelan school of, uh, of medicine is not where you should go to save time. Uh, exactly. No <laughs> online degrees, please. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not for medical. Doctor, no, no. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, so when, um, in your early career, or even maybe in college, one of the things I'm really fascinated by is is the nature of mentoring and finding being a mentor, but also the, those people that sort of took you under your wing. The first uh, for me, it was the first job I got. The guy knew that I didn't know what I knew, right? He like, well, he clearly doesn't know what I need him to know, but I can see he's bright enough that I could help him get there, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was really valuable to me. So I'm curious about other people's experience with, with mentors. I've had positive, negative, and neutral, like most sure. people. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I try to remember them. And my first job out of 
college was uh, I got an offer to work for GE down in Raleigh, North Carolina. Nice. So we moved down there. I got married to my wife. Um, she came with me. It was part of the whole. Are you it was okay part moving? of the it was part of the GE uh, contract. You got yeah, a GE wife. Gave me gave me a wife. It nice. was, really worked out great. <laughs> totally kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she'll listen to this. <laughs> but my wife and I actually had a very interesting conversation. Of you know, right before I asked her to marry me, like a week before, I'm like. Kept on pumping her on. Are you OK moving and leaving upstate <laughs> 10 below zero New York? And she was always like confidently. Yes. I'm like, OK, then I will ask you to marry me. Let's do yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I got down there and my first boss was she's wonderful. Her name was Nancy. And she allowed me to kind of explore things. So the job I was hired for wasn't exactly what I ended up having to do, which happens a lot. You get in and, you know, I'm faced with, you know, you have to program in this. I don't know that. Mm -hmm. She allowed me to kind of do what I was more natural with and kind of explore a little, even if it wasn't necessarily germane to the business right then and there. Sure. And I like that freedom mm -hmm. and it, it reinforced my confidence. Yeah. Because, you know, you're very insecure when you first get to your job out of college. Or your 13th job, whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, do I know what I'm, what am I doing here? Yeah. You know? I got them. I convinced them in the interview. Uh oh, now I have to actually do it Because they can day. still fire me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I had a mentor there. Which he was a great guy, but the one thing that always stuck with me all these years is one of the things he always said to me uh, was, if you don't learn COBOL and get off of this internet web stuff, you'll never have a career. <laughs> and I, I was glad I was stubborn. I respected him greatly. The funny thing was you're both right, though. Absolutely. Think about it. The stuff he was doing with COBOL and C++ on Oracle is still very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And the stuff that I'm learning in web, I, I think it's still here. So for now, you know, <laughs> it's it's teetering. Uh, it, that's interesting because uh, one of my early experiences was, was with Mumps, which is an OS built in '67, and 80% uh, of the hospitals still run on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guys that do Mumps make way more money than you or I, sure, because there's only about 12 of them, right? So the demand is huge and. You know, anyone who wants to make money in this business, I always tell them, go learn mumps. It's right. horrible work, but it, it depends on what you're you're in it for, you know. Yeah, it, it's like that where you get those jobs that are just more obscure now. Yeah. Which used to be very popular. I mean, there's a ton of COBOL and mainframe apps still out there. Absolutely. Um, a lot of big iron still runs COBOL and they have no interest in moving. Yeah, not everything's in the cloud. No. <laughs> so as much as, you know, Microsoft and Amazon would like you to think. Yeah. <laughs> it's not all there right now. And that's why there's an opportunity, but. I'm just waiting for AS400 VMs to be available oh, on yeah. AWS. <laughs> it, it is funny, though. I mean, the mentors we have over the years and the people who inspire us in different ways. I mean, Bill Gates is always a big inspiration for sure. me. Sure. Never knew him, obviously, but. Well, you um, worked at Microsoft. Everyone gets a one-on-one -on -one with him, right? That's yeah, how you the, get your job. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but, you know, like finding people that you can get into, some of my best mentors are people who weren't necessarily my superior officer or my colleague or just somebody I happen to really respect at a company uh, and learned little bits from it. And I, I don't even think I've been good enough to always reciprocate and let them know how much they inspired me in, in some ways. But there's many people I worked with that really... You know, Scott Guthrie is a great one to yeah, think yeah. about. And I have actually expressed this to him is he encouraged me in a lot of ways when I was at Microsoft that I wasn't getting on my own. Sure. And he also encouraged me in the way that he was extremely hard, meaning you wanted you. I like to think that I did a good job and that's why he kept on doing it. But he was one of those people where he had a high bar. Of course. And he doesn't. I'm, this is my words. I don't think he suffers fools, meaning you either do where his vision is heading or he'll find somebody else to do yeah. go there. Uh, and I think the utmost respect for the things he's done, I mean, ASP.net, Azure, all that, but finding somebody who has that drive and passion and finds a way to reinvent themselves all the time and knows when to let go of something and also knows when to change direction, but also knows when to hang on to that bowl while it's bucking really hard and stick with it. Absolutely. Uh, and that isn't going to, he's know, good at that. Uh, abandon that. It's interesting because, uh, I'm sure I've talked about it on the show before, but I'll, I'll, I'll bore those listeners. But I had the same sort of experience. Uh, I had a there was a point in my career where I, got, I had an offer to go work with some of the development guys who now are the plural site guys, yeah. for the most part, and uh, and worked directly under Chris Sell. So I had this sort of, sort of hero worship at the time mm -hmm. for um, 
And I ha- there was this, there was a real decision to make. Do I go there and be just one of the guys or do I stay in this mid-sized company where I'm the guy, right? I'm the smart guy in the room there. I know I'm not going to be the smart guy in the room there, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, being challenged every day, even though it can wear on you, changes changes the way you work. And so, you know, I always encourage young developers, if you're afraid of going to a job, you should try to go to that job. If you're looking for comfort, that's fine, but you're not going to grow. You're not going to grow. Yeah, I agree. And, and like when I went to Microsoft a couple of years ago under Tim Sneath, who a uh, great guy. Yeah. I worked on a team with uh, Adam Kinney and uh, Jaime Rodriguez and George Rosardo, a bunch of these wonderful people. And I was nervous as heck. Yeah. I mean, you and I talked about this when I was interviewing. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go from being the guy in this to just one more cog in the big wheel. Yeah. And, and a lot worried. of really bright guys are going to be sitting next to you. You mean, I there was always huge brighter people than me for there. Kenny. I've got a lot of respect for, um, um, for, uh, you just said his name and now I can't remember it. So I'm going to edit that out. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm so bad at names. I should never even try to say it during the podcast. Uh, you know, but I think it is, uh, it, it takes, it, it shouldn't take something special for someone to, to risk that. But, you know, no. if I'm not afraid, I'm too comfortable is kind of the way I, I feel. You have to push that, push the envelope, you know, live on the edge a little bit. You got to find what motivates you because you yeah. don't want to become dead at your job. Yeah. You want to constantly strive to do a little bit better. And it doesn't mean take unnecessary risks. You sure. You don't know when to weigh yeah. the reward. Like to me, some of the biggest risks I took, one was going to Microsoft and then once I got there, I realized my style was not their style. Sure. And I, I just made a decision. But you did prosper there. I mean, you. I did you, well. Yeah. Yeah. I just decided early that I wasn't going to be like the people that were kind a of the molded. hundred hours a week and that's yeah. all they did. And they didn't, you know, they neglected their family in some respects because they were so devoted to, you know, which is something I know is really important to you, your family. Yeah. So, it was hard to, to not. And especially and if your family's not happy in Seattle. True, which my family was not. Yeah. Other than my one daughter. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, it was interesting because you, you have to do that. And, and for me, I just decided that the evangelist role back then was more of a, you either do training or you work with the customers. Right. And I said, I want to do both of those, but I want to focus on the third part of the triumvirate. I always said there's interacting with the customer. What are the people actually doing with their product? Building training material mm-hmm. or vending it out or whatever, right. getting it done, calling people like you say, hey, Sean, I need a class on such and such. Sure. And the third part is just integrating with the community of developers who are out there working and the socialization of it to kind of, I figured I could influence 10 people, but it's like a pyramid scheme. Yeah. Maybe I'm made off. <laughs> you know, uh, if I can lose 10 people to influence 10 more and so on and so forth. And that's where we had like the, remember the silver light insiders yeah. and that whole concept to me, it just made it much easier to get the word out to hundreds of thousands of people. Mm-hmm. And that was not something that was really. And in mean, some ways that was too successful because when yes. silver light, when we would, wanted to encourage Silverlight developers to l- look at, you know, Windows 8 XAML or maybe even look at the web stuff. You, you got them to be entrenched. <laughs> yes, I, I did. I blame you personally. I don't know if you know. No. I, I did That's get hate mail. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not from Sean, but at least I don't think it was from Sean. <laughs> no, no, not directly. Um, I just told everyone to contact you instead of me. That oh, thanks. <laughs> and my email address is Sean at Wildermuth dot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Uh, so, before you worked at Microsoft, were you doing a lot of speaking? Were you up front or were you more of a yes developer? Yes and no. I was absolutely terrified of speaking when I was younger uh, to the point of uh, I let it paralyze me in some cases. Interesting. I wanted to be into drama and theater. Nice. And, and but, but having stage fright. But having severe stage fright. Yeah. To the points of shaking and butterflies and just not being able to speak right and mumbling. And it was just, you know, insecurities galore. Sure. So I was that guy who just never took that risk and tried out or did or, and then I remember being at my first, my second job uh, after GE, a company called DB Basics, mm-hmm. and they were in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I was doing development. And I just took a risk one time. I said, you know, I'd really like to train. I've nice. never done it before, but I'd like to. I was a tech lead. Yeah. So I can train three people. Why not train Ten, however many? Twenty, whatever. So I got, I switched over to roles of doing that. And then I had a presentation with about 120 to 150 customers come in and I was going to do some topic on who knows what visual internet, let's say. Right. And right before I was going to speak, I went to the bathroom to wash my hands, whatever. 
And uh, while washing my hands in the sink, all the water flew up and onto my pants. <laughs> and everyone's really, biggest fear. It was literally looked like I had just wet myself <laughs> all and was just in that spot. <laughs> So, yeah, it was just in that spot. And then I just kept on trying to frantically dry it. And then I realized I had three minutes left. I'm like, there's no way this is <laughs> no going way. to work out. And I'm keeping on wearing khakis. So it's like light brown and dark brown. <laughs> so I grab some kind of a folder of some sort. And who goes to a podium with a folder, you know? Right. And but I'm you walking down the aisle. you to get behind the folder so they would dry during the talk. <laughs> That's hilarious. And I'm Italian. I'm Sicilian. I, I move my hands. And I'm surprised <laughs> I have knocked the microphone over yet here. <laughs> And at the podium, I'm standing still and keeping my hands in front of myself. <laughs> and I remember after that, I don't remember how it really went overall, but I remember after it, people liked it. And I said, you know what? Nothing worse could ever happen to me in no. front of a hundred and something people. And people noticed. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's not like I. Yeah, yeah. You can't completely hide it, but. But I forced myself in that situation and it was, it was horrific, but, and I've had flubs since then. I'm sure you have sure. too. Yeah, everyone does. Well, who cares? You can't laugh at yourself then. Absolutely. I like the story of Billy Conley. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a Scottish uh, comedian. Yes, I do. Yes, he's, yes. In his, he's, I think, around 70 now, and he's been doing stand-up or music or usually a combination of both since he was uh, 17. Every time he gets on stage, he throws up. Uh, right before he gets on stage, he throws up. He has this terrific stage fright. It has never gone away. Wow. But the, what he gets back from the audience is so good, it's worth it to him. And uh, I, I remember that a lot when, you know, like I just did a presentation. Uh, we're here at the uh, Pluralsight Author Summit, and I had to give a quick presentation for the authors, which it's, it's a tough room. Let's, sure. let's be honest. <laughs> it's a very tough room. And uh, I haven't been that nervous in a little while. But, you know, once I got up on stage and the first joke was out, it's all fine. And that's kind of what happens to me when I speak is if I can get that first line out. Then it just it's fine no matter what happens. But even if even if a demo goes bad, I'm it's never that bad. Always have a backup plan. Just move around it and don't do Azure talks. Oh wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> don't rely on something you have no control over. Let's put it that way. Yeah, like the internet. Yes, like especially in a hotel internet. room. And so, what what is your role in mentoring uh, developers at, at Disney? Because you're still at Disney, right? I am at Walt Disney. Yeah. yeah. So it's a lot of so fun. Wait, wait. Are you a ticket taker? Is that right? You now just take tickets. At well, you gate. saw the picture of me on Facebook, right? I did. I'm, I'm handing out maps in front of the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> That's awesome, actually. So, I know yeah, you love that. I do. I, I love. Um, I love Disney. I'm a huge Disney fan. You are. And it's. it's we moved from Seattle back to Orlando. Um, my wife gave me two years and said, "If I don't like Seattle in two years, you're going to move, right?" I said, "Yep." So we did. <laughs> Almost two years of the day, too. The last day of Build was my last day at Microsoft. That's funny. So we got to Disney, and the role is, uh, my title is Principal Application Developer for the Center of Excellence. Um, it's a fancy title for basically our team helps make sure that the quality bar nice. stays there uh, for parks and resorts at Disney. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my job is just making sure, you know, hey, you're building an app. Let's just make sure it's scalable, testable, maintainable. Yeah. So we do a lot of guidelines and we have a few rules. Um, you know, the rules are very few, quite frankly, but the guidelines are usually like, eh, you may, it's okay in this project, but next time we should do this. And so do you project reviews as well for the internal projects? Uh, yeah. Or? We have automated code review tools now. Oh, nice. Which helps a lot because uh, I used to spend 40 hours a week code reviewing every project. Wow. And we have a lot of projects. Yeah. So now we have tools to go through most of it and then we eyeball things that you have sure. to eyeball. Um, we've got security reviews. I mean, like any company, you've got yeah. all these tools. Uh, but we still have the human factor. And, but yeah, the, nice. the tools help you figure out what's wrong, not teach how to do it right, right? right. I mean, because the data you're getting out of those tools, you still have to sit down and whether it's with a large audience because you see it pervasively or one-on-one -on -one with some developers to, to change that. Yes. Or? So sometimes, so when I got there, the team had uh, changed quite a bit. And one of the things that the, they had done in the past was it was more of a, uh, a governance team. Right. Where they had blocking exceptions and, you know, thou shalt not type things. Right. Uh, and then basically when I got there, it was all new people on the team. So we had an opportunity to re-energize what we were doing. So I said, hey, let's, let's look at it the other way. Let's, let's try to make it their idea. Meaning right. if I'm talking to Sean about his code and I see something wrong with it, first I have to reflect and go, is it wrong as I don't like it or is right. it really wrong? Is it because I didn't write it or because it's actually a problem? Exactly. Right. 
is this going to have a actual negative impact on Disney down the road? Right. And you know what? Most of the time, those answers are no. Right. It's just, for example, Hungarian notation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We, I think we all I, said I we're just past had a that. flashback. Wow, <laughs> I haven't had to, I haven't heard of a Hungarian notation in about ten years. And wow. Honestly, I haven't recently either. But I thought it was a great segue <laughs> because I mean, if you see it, you probably have that visceral reaction. Yeah. But is it going to hurt your code? No. No. If no. somebody wants to use a three character or one character prefix for their variables, I wouldn't recommend it. But it's not going to stop you from going to yeah. production. It's better than one character. Very yes. Annoying, right. You know, <laughs> which is a hot topic today. Yes. <laughs> Every demo should just be one character variables. I'm, I'm going to stand on that. We could try that. It's minification, yeah. man. Yeah. I've minified my demo for you. <laughs> I pre minified. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of times what we do is now is we uh, will go to a team and say, hey, you know, like I had this question recently and I have a lightning talk later tonight about this here at the summit uh, about the five whys. Yeah. So somebody asks you a question like I have this common thing where we're, we're doing testing a lot and I do this with people inside, outside of Disney. So I can't test my code. Why? Well, because it's not testable. Why? Yeah. Well, because, you know, I look at my code and it's 6,000 lines in this function. Why is your function 6,000 lines of code? Right. Well, because that's the logic that it takes to do this X task. Say, well, let's look inside there. We look at it and go, okay, well, why do you have so many comments in your code? Because it takes that much to explain what's happening. So you get down to it, and the reason they couldn't do that is because they had these large things yeah. that they were dealing with. Um, and this was actually a, something that happened at Microsoft, oddly. <laughs> Not Disney, really? but um, <laughs> we're looking at this code and doing that, and I actually sat down with the developer. Instead of telling them, you're bad, you're horrible, go back and fix it, they said, let's go and do a pair programming. Yeah. Sat in a room for an hour with the team and said, let's look at that code, and let's break it down. And I actually refactored the first like 100 or 200 lines to little functions, like four yeah. or five line functions. And in the process, all the comments were disappearing. Right. They didn't need them anymore because the function was called go tell Sean he's a good boy. Right. We yeah. know what that function does now. Yeah. And there's not enough code in it that you need long explanations. You, yeah, you don't. Yeah. And sometimes they'd have a if statement with a switch that had a for loop that called a function. And it's like, repeat. Right. And when you're done, it was the cool thing was after about 15, 20 minutes of me doing this, and I've done this exercise 20 or 30 times. Sure. After doing it 15, 20 minutes, the team in the room has always then just said, get out of the way, John. I'm going to do it. I'm excited about this. Yeah. Now I understand what, you know. And there's 6,000 lines of code in one function becomes 3,000 lines of code in 100 functions. Right. With no that comments. Are, and they're all testable. And they're all testable. They're yeah. refactorable. And now they can reuse code. Functions were going away. Yeah. Because they're like, I was actually repeating this. So I, you say, what do I do a lot? A lot of times for me, it's if I just walked in and told them that. Uh, that's not as effective. Well, it seems like you're doing much the same sort of thing you were doing at Microsoft, but you're doing it to these large internal teams. Right, right. And that's that's exciting because I know that was something you were really passionate about at Microsoft. Was that an opportunity to to help raise developers into doing to, to being the kind of developers they want to be? You know, because sometimes yeah. schedule forces developers to make poor decisions, right? Because you have to. There's, there's always. I think that. you're right. There's always something that has to be sacrificed. Yeah. I was never the, and I still am not the most technical of all the people like in this room at the summit and sure. never been the smartest guy in the room, but I, my thing has always been, I know that I'm good at helping look at a problem and figuring out how can I simplify it? That makes sense. And I communicate it. And there's a need for that out there. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Well, this has been a great talk. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks. This was fun. Yeah. And we're about at 30 minutes. So you should be at your job now because my goal of the podcast is to be a commute long. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I always hated get, going, getting to my job with a podcast. And, and having it still going. And I'm like, do I just wait in the car for it to be done? Because I'll never come back to it, right? I will never come back to right, the last right. 10 minutes of the podcast. So thanks 